I have questions now about whether Rodney was really guilty. In the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals' most recent denial of relief for Rodney Reed, they determined his lawyers failed to prove that no rational juror could have found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet, at least one original juror from the trial has publicly stated on national television that she now has those exact doubts. Since then, there have been a lot of things that I've learned in that 20 years or heard about that have made me wonder if Rodney was framed. One thing she may have learned is the existence of a lab report indicating the DNA presence of two police officers on two beer cans found near the body. One officer, David Hall, was Jimmy Fennell's patrol partner and neighbor. The other officer was Ed Samella, who was an investigator on the Stacey Stites case and ended up dead six months later due to a suspicious gunshot to the head. Of course, this DNA report never made it to Rodney Reed's defense team, and the jury was never made aware of it. Maybe the juror learned that Jimmy Fennell had bragged during his police training class that if he ever discovered his girlfriend cheating, he would strangle her with a belt so he wouldn't leave any fingerprints. Or maybe the juror heard about one of the many stories of Fennell's uncontrollable anger, such as the one witnessed by former Bastrop County Jailer Shane Wallace. I remember one day I was going to look at the field, and Jimmy Fennell was standing at the edge of the road with a Hispanic girl. He, I mean, he was having the most intense argument with her, and she was standing there taking it out. I remember after driving by, I thought, man, that guy could have killed Stacey just by the way he's acting. I mean, he's angry enough right now that he could have done it, just looking at the way he did, his mannerisms and his behavior. Perhaps the juror heard about the affidavit from the woman who started dating Fennell three months after the murder, who claimed Fennell stalked and screamed obscenities at her for months after they broke up. She also claims he called all black people by the N-word. He pulled over and harassed future boyfriends and made her scared for herself and her family. This woman claimed she filed a police report over Fennell's harassment, which would have been required to be turned over to Rodney Reed's defense team and would have been admissible at trial to impeach Fennell's character. However, Giddings police say the report was lost and Reed's lawyers were never made aware of Fennell's frightening misconduct right prior to the trial. Or maybe the juror heard that the Giddings Police Department and Jimmy Fennell were sued by a local man who claimed in February 1996, just a month before Stacy Stites' murder, Jimmy Fennell, while on duty, threatened his life with a loaded gun pressed to his head for absolutely no reason. This lawsuit was removed from court two months prior to Rodney Reed being arrested and its resolution has been obscured from public record. Perhaps the juror heard of Jimmy Fennell's ex-wife who confided in a co-worker that she was nervous of Fennell's jealousy and temper. She had suspicions of Fennell's involvement in the Stites murder and she showed up to work with bruises on her face claiming they were caused by Fennell in a fit of anger. Or most likely, the juror heard about the 10-year prison sentence Fennell received for raping a woman he had taken into custody. Jimmy Fennell Jr. is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he detained. This victim was courageous enough to come forward, press charges, and be interviewed on national television about the violent crime. He just kept telling me to shut up. He asked me to dance for him. And I told him no. And when I told him no, he got mad. And he grabbed me and slammed me up against the back of his car where the trunk is. I kept telling him to stop, but he just told me to shut up, that I knew I liked it. And then if I told anybody that he'd hunt me down when he got out of prison and kill me. This victim's courage to come forward empowered many other victims of Fennell's sexual crimes to contact authorities, including a woman who claimed in the spring of 2007, Fennell took her into custody, strip searched her, and drove her to a secluded dirt road where he raped her. Another victim in August 2007 claimed Fennell planted drugs on her, pushed her into nearby bushes, and requested that they meet up later for sex in order for her to avoid jail or having her children taken away from her. And many other women came forward, mostly poor and with criminal backgrounds. And though investigators found their claims to be credible and consistent, Georgetown police did not bring any additional charges against Fennell for these accusations, and the true number of his victims will never be known. It's hard to tell exactly what new information has given the juror doubts, 
and equally difficult to discern why the Texas courts have not been swayed by such an obvious pattern of violent behavior, and instead have opted to move forward with an execution in this case, despite such serious concerns. Now, the man who was originally the person of interest in the murder of Stacey Stites will be released on parole next Friday. Jimmy Finnell is finishing a 10-year sentence for an unrelated crime of kidnapping and improper sexual activity with a person in custody. Additional evidence pointing to Finnell includes the victim's clipped fingernails, a method used to remove forensic evidence that would have been known by a police officer, and a staged crime scene indicating the attacker knew the victim and wanted her to be found. And the fact that Jimmy Fennell surreptitiously closed the bank account that he shared with Stacy Stites on the morning of her disappearance, hours before she was found dead. And finally, the two failed polygraph tests, which indicated Fennell lied when he asked if he was involved in the murder of Stacy Stites. After the second failed test, Fennell pled the fifth and requested an attorney. Another critical fact kept from the jurors when deciding Rodney Reed's fate. A so former Georgetown police officer released from prison after serving nine and a half years for kidnapping and raping a woman he'd arrested. Imagine how much more evidence may have been recovered tying Fennell to the murder had lead investigator Rocky Wardlow actually done his job and searched the apartment that Jimmy Fennell and Stacy Stites shared. There's always something that doesn't get done and searching her apartment was that thing here. Um, I wish they would have searched her apartment. I think in hindsight, they wish they would have searched the apartment. But he didn't, and instead forfeited a key opportunity to gather forensic evidence from the location she was last seen alive, and we now know she was most likely killed. Rocky Wardlow also failed to fully process the abandoned pickup truck, especially the biological evidence found on the front floorboard noted by investigators that would have confirmed Stacy's earlier time of death, thus exonerating Reed. Instead, Wardlow returned the truck to Jimmy Fennell three days later, who sold it immediately to a local dealership. And finally, Wardlow failed to fully interview or properly document interviews with key witnesses close to the victim, including neighbor and close friend of Stacy, Carla Hall, who spent the whole evening before the murder with Stacy and who has come forth and stated on multiple occasions, including this 2015 Facebook Messenger chat with Giddings resident Wendy Wallace, that she was awoken at 3.30 a.m. on the night of the murder and seeing Stacy Stites' mother's car, which she knew Stacy and Jimmy also shared, being driven through the front yard of her mobile home, a vital piece of information that directly implicates Fennell, who testified he was at home sleeping at this time, and possible other co-conspirators while completely exonerating Rodney Reed. In fact, recently discovered police notes, whose authors remain unknown, indicates that an officer confirmed this very same story with Carla Hall shortly after the murder. But her statement never made it in official police reports, and Carla Hall, who was one of the last people to see Stacy Stites alive, was never called by prosecutors or the defense at Reed's original trial. The question is not whether Rocky Wardlow was covering up for Jimmy Fennell's crime, but why? How could Rodney Reed ever expect justice when the police in charge of the investigation were manipulating the evidence from the very beginning? And how could the state, in good conscience, execute a man with all of the extensive evidence implicating another suspect, documented jurors doubt? I have questions now about whether Rodney was really guilty. And so many critical questions concerning the integrity of the police who investigated the case. It's almost as if the state is more afraid of facing the truth than they are of carrying out an actual wrongful execution. But what if a new witness statement were to emerge that revealed that Jimmy Fennell had made arrangements to substantially financially benefit from Stacy Stites' death? Would they listen then? Well, at this point, the boyfriend does. That's right. That's a prime suspect. The person that we're trying to find is in the Exxon. 